This is Touched by Heaven, everyday encounters with God, those moments when heaven and earth collide and we see God. We see his hand reaching out to us, attempting to get our attention. Attention, attention shoppers, attention. Hi there, Trapper Jack here. Welcome to Touched by Heaven. Special episode. What does that mean? What does it mean, Trapper? Special episode. Uh, it means it's shorter. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it's Christmas week as we put this together, and you know, my wife Elizabeth and I, we were always saying, well, you know, it's a busy week, not everybody has time to listen. You know, maybe, well, you're listening whenever that is, so you know, we'll just do this episode for you. It has to do with the star. There's a message in that star. Every year, there's the conversation. What was the star? Was it that? Uh, a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn that we just had this year. First time in 800 years the planets look that close. Or maybe it was a comet with the tail. Hey, maybe it was just an angel. You know, it's a nice, nice bright angel. What was it? Well, we're, we're going to get some answers in this episode. We are, we are. With the help of a couple of mystics, with the help of, uh, let's see, Stanley Kubrick, who uh, created 2001 Space Odyssey. Johann Strauss is going to help us in this episode. And whatever else happens to come up, this uh, because this is this is very touched by heaven. What is touched by heaven? It's um, understanding what God just said. He doesn't always speak English. He speaks burning bush. <laughs> you know, he he speaks star. You know, so I need some star music. I have some. Let's see. Here we go. This is our star music. There's your Johann Strauss, the Blue Danube. But for me, when I hear this music, I think 2001: Space Odyssey. Kubrick uh, chose uh, to use it. This is an interesting part of the story. So Kubrick's making this movie. He hires a composer and uh, gives him the idea of what he wants. Okay, okay, it goes away and all that. Uh, in the meantime, as he's put together the movie, he needs what's called uh, a placeholder. Placeholder, a uh, music that sets the tone for particular scenes. So he uses this and other classical m music to set the scene, the, the tone of what he wants the composer to put together, okay? All right, composer comes back with his music. Great job, wonderful. Only Kubrick tells him, I like this better. I like this classical music better. This, sorry, I'll pay you, but this is better. Because in the movie, you see this beautiful, it's like a dance of these giant spacecraft in the future beautiful precision of working with each other and they're flying out there amongst the stars and oh my gosh it's gorgeous and so sorry composer but the original if you will the original thought was actually better so that'll be our star music when we get to that now there are these two mystics these two incredibly connected women Connected to God, that is. You have Anne Catherine Emmerich. She lived a couple of hundred years ago. Her body still has not decayed. I think there's a message in that. She has the wounds of Christ on her body. I think there's a message in that. And she had a lot of visitations from Jesus who told her a lot of things. She wrote down a lot of things. And those things were um, read by director Mel Gibson for his movie, The Passion of the Christ. This movie was so incredibly successful. Most, most biblical movies do okay, they do all right. And in my book, most biblical movies are pretty much a bore, sorry. But what Mel Gibson did so right, he brought it to life by looking at what Anne Catherine Emmerich had written, and that's what he put on the screen. He took scripture, of course, because everything she wrote down that Jesus told her that happened in no way conflicted with scripture, and that's the key in all of this. And so it just, it just brought everything, all the detail to life. And so Mel Gibson's movie made $600 million, took him $30 million to make it, it made $600 million, and because no one in the film industry would help him distribute or do anything with this, this was just way too Christian, he pocketed $400 million. Say what? Yeah, Mel did just fine with that movie. And now there's a sequel coming. I'm not quite sure how you top that one, but Caviezel and Jim Caviezel, who played Christ and all that, say it's incredible, so... I'm, I'm looking forward to it, looking forward to it. I'm assuming we're going we're gonna to get more Anne Catherine Emmerich here and all this. But anyway, so, so Mel Gibson knew where to, how to bring it all to life. He used the writings of Anne Catherine Emmerich. We, we take a look at what some of those writings about what Jesus said about his birth, and we add that to what Maria de Jesus de Agreda, another mystic, had to say 400 years ago. Four, and, and again, her body is uncorrupted. 
Another sign. She's also the one I know more about Maria de Jesus de Greta than, than Emmerich, just, just because I'm so dazzled by how she bilocated. Some saints can do that. Maria de Jesus de Agrada from Spain. From her convent, she was, she was a cloistered nun, which means she went nowhere, other than somehow, through, uh, through this act of God, she was transported to what we now know as Texas and New Mexico, and there she met with the indigenous people of the time, what we would call Native Americans, and she evangelized, catechic. What's that word? Catechist? She evangelized is what she did. She told them about Christ. She got them prepared to, she then sent them off, told them where the priests were, the friars were, go that away and be baptized. 60,000 were baptized. 60,000 were brought into the church, into the faith because of this mystic Maria de Jesus de Agreda, who wrote this tome called The Mystical City of God, where all this is. And I mean, I, again, uncorrupted, by locating, undisputed too. They then traveled, people from the Americas traveled to her and asked her questions. She talked about the terrain. She talked about the people. She described people, uh, the, the priests, the, the, the one-eyed Indian chief, and this, all these things that there's no way she could have known. And this is, this is exactly the same time frame as the pilgrims, when the hundred pilgrims are getting all the attention you know, that we read about. Meanwhile, 60,000 are being brought into the faith, are becoming Christians, thanks to Maria de Jesus de Agreda 400 years ago. Amazing. God's way, again, of saying, maybe you ought to pay attention to this, to this person. So as we look at what they have written for us, we find out so much. We find out that at the birth, the angels were sent out, and the world changed. In this moment, the world was different now. Both mystics talk about how the sun sped up, the, the stars glowed brighter, trees growing, flowers growing, everything in bloom. It just everything just kind of exploded on earth. The good people of earth, the followers of God, glowed too, in a sense. They, they, it was just this upcharge betterment of the world. At the same time, inside pagan temples, a lot of those pagan gods crumbled and it said that the wicked became more wicked, more miserable. Things changed. The Messiah was definitely here. But also, the angels went out to the three wise men. Oh, i got to get my star music going here. Hold on here. got to get my star music, because here we go. Now we're talking about the star and the three wise Were there three? Yes. And these guys had known each other a long time. This was like the equivalent of old high school buddies, college buddies. These were Renaissance men. These were smart guys. They knew their natural sciences. They also knew scripture. They lived in Arabia, Persia, and Saba, and they all had a dream, pretty much the same dream. And they were awakened from this dream, and in that dream, they understood the Messiah was here, the Redeemer, the Savior. And they got out of bed, threw themselves on the, the floor, and praised God. They knew they'd been given the information. The information, get your, get, get your stuff together. Your provisions, your servants, your camels. There's a star waiting for you. And you and your two other buddies are going to follow that star to the Messiah, to that Savior. So that's what they did. They got it together and went out. And they met at the star, which we'll explain what it was in a moment here, but they followed that star. Down the road, the highways, the byways, the back roads, if you will, knowing what would be at the end of that trip. Very dramatic. Oh, yeah. So they got to Jerusalem. Couldn't find the star. Star disappeared. And they're asking around. Uh, any new babies around, around here? Herod heard they were in town, brought them to the palace. They tell them, we've had this dream. We're following the star. Herod, you know, oh, that's great. He's panic-stricken. According to the mystics, absolutely panic-stricken. You sure to come back and tell me where he is? Okay, we will do. <sighs> yeah, not so much. So uh, that's so much for that. And then back to Starland again. Again, following the star. Oh, what was the star? Was it a conjunction? Was it planets? Jupiter, Saturn? Well, think about it. If I tell you, hey, come on over tonight. Uh, the directions? Oh, just follow. Uh, just uh, uh, I'm under the conjunction of, of Saturn and Jupiter. You gonna find my house? Probably not. Follow the comet with the tail? Probably, probably not gonna get you to my house. Angel? Angel might be able to do it. 
But according to the mystics, it was a supernatural phenomenon. This was, this was something created just for this moment that was down here in the atmosphere, this ball of light, but not a perfect ball, kind of pointing at the top and the bottom, this supernatural phenomenon that was created for this moment alone that they could follow, that they could see in front of them. And they followed that star to Bethlehem and to, was it a stable, a cave? What was it? Well, they followed and they found out it was a cave. A little wooden attachment to it, but it was a cave. And it came above the cave then down into the cave, this ball of light, this star that came down and hovered over the Christ child and shone down upon him and then dissolved. How beautiful is that? And the three wise men came in and saw Mary glowing, inner glow, inner glow, and holding the Christ child, a greater glow. And they threw themselves on the ground and began to worship Jesus Christ. And they wondered, how did we get here? How do you top this? He's here. Infused in them was all the knowledge of the virgin birth. They understood Joseph. They were about to congratulate Joseph too on being chosen to be the protector, the provider, the earthly father of Jesus, the earthly husband of Mary. He knew his role, and they congratulate him for it, for it. But when they got up, they went over to Mary and Jesus, and, they, and one of the kings took Mary's hand to kiss her hand, and she withdrew her hand and instead gave them the hand of Jesus. Is that, that's just so Mary. It's not about me. It's about this guy. <laughs> always, always bringing us to Jesus. And they adored him. They had questions, of course, but interesting. The mystics talk about how, you know what you hear about in heaven? No one actually speaks words. You just have to think it, and the other hears it. That's what was going on between Jesus and Mary. So when they'd ask a question, she would look to Jesus. Jesus would think it. Mary would pick it up and then relay the information onto the Magi. Beautiful. Gifts, of course. They had the gold frankincense, the gold incense and myrrh. What did Mary do with that? gave it away to the poor. Some of, some of the gold she gave to the priest who performed the circumcision on Jesus and to help him with his ministry, his church, but they gave it away to the poor. They helped others with it, of course. She took those, uh, the swaddling clothes of Jesus and she gave these different articles to the Magi and they then encased them in gold and in jewelry, took them back to their, their home countries where miracles happened. Miraculous healings happened. These were relics of Jesus Christ. These, these relics had touched the body of Jesus Christ. They were holy, of course. They offered Mary, Joseph, how about, you know, we have wealth. How about we get, no, no thank you. How about we build you a house? You guys need to have a nice house. You should, this is the king. You need, no. They took none of it. This is God's way. It starts here. We, we're we're going to stay humble. <laughs> it starts here in a cave. The humblest of beginnings. Interesting, Roman soldiers did come by later and did talk to Joseph according to the mystics, but obviously nothing happened in this place. This, there's, this is no place for a king. Nothing. It's also said that the servants that came with the Magi, they, they saw none of this heavenly stuff. They felt nothing. The Magi are seeing angels. They're seeing this heavenly place. This is... <laughs> you know, this is the place. This is it. But the servants couldn't see it. It just looked despicable to them. Also, it said that uh, these that's the relics, the clothing, swaddling clothes. If you were a believer, if you were a believer, and the Magi would bring out these these articles, you could you could smell some of this heavenly whatever whatever that scent was. They could smell. But if you weren't a believer, you smelled nothing. Later, the Magi would ride away, going back again with a star. The star reappeared, or a different star, however all this worked, but again, to take the back roads, to take them the safe way, away from Herod and back to Persia and Arabia and Saba. And they began to evangelize and talking about, and of course, the miracles that happened through the relics of Jesus Christ. Just 
just a glorious time, a glorious time and the special star. So as we come to an end of a very bizarre year, my prayer was always when, when COVID happened was that maybe with, with the whole world's silence, maybe we would turn more to God. Maybe we'd understand that what he giveth, he can taketh away and all of that. Maybe people would get a little, a little holier. I don't, I don't know if I've seen that. I've seen it with some. A lot of anger out there. A lot of anger. My prayer is that you feel right now a little closer to God than you did maybe a year ago. Maybe Touched by Heaven had a little bit to do with that. I pray so. I pray that a year from now, we all feel a little closer to God, to Jesus, than we do right now. My prayer is that whatever stars we're, we're all following something. (laughs) We are, whether we know it or not, we're following something. My prayer for you is that that whatever you are following, wherever it is you are going in your journey, that that star takes you right to Jesus Christ and nowhere else and that you feel his presence more than ever before in the coming year. I am praying for you. My wife and I, Elizabeth, are praying for you. We ask for your prayers as well as we work together here to follow Christ. That's what it's all about, conforming our mind to the mind of Christ to be more like him. Mary points us towards him. Joseph, this is the year of Joseph. He points us towards Jesus. Let's follow that star to Jesus Christ in the new year. God bless you. My name is Trapper Jack, and we'll see you next week with more of Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God.